Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Parenting Dur During COVID-19 webinar. My name is Andrea. I'm so happy and honored that you guys can all be here. Um, before we begin our presentation, I would like to introduce um, our Executive Director, Dr. Pamela Epstein-Keen, who will give you a brief welcome. Hi, as Andrea said, I'm Pam, and welcome um, to this Thrive webinar that I'm so very excited to be able to offer you on parenting uh, during COVID-19, which we are officially now in our 11th month. I'm so grateful and honored to introduce my two colleagues, Dr. Liseth Rojas Flores and Dr. Joey Fung. They are both colleagues of mine at um, Fuller Theological Seminary. They are both excellent child and adolescent and family psychologist. Lisette particularly specializes in trauma and resilience um, and studying populations of youth who've lived in really significant adversity. Um, and Joey specializes in areas of mindfulness, enabling kids who are struggling for various reasons uh, to be able to gain um, some of their mental health strengths through various mindfulness approaches. Um, they have many strengths as therapists and psychologists, but those are two areas of specialty that are particularly relevant in this enduring and challenging time. Um, at Thrive, we often talk about building lives of hope, um, of purpose, and joy. And a reality is that mental health issues can get in the way of that. Um, depression, anxiety, uh, and other issues that are extremely high these days, given um, obviously issues around COVID and other habits that kids have cultivated um, in the 21st century um, are really getting in the way of their ability to thrive. So I'm so grateful for Lisette and Joey to bring their expertise um, and how parents can identify when kids are struggling significantly and, and when and how they can make changes in their lives and encourage them um, to eventually thrive. So thank you for joining us. I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you, Pam. Now, before we begin our presentation, I did want to remind you guys that this webinar will be recorded and will be made available on demand. Um, on that note, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to submit them in your Q&A feature below in your Zoom control panel. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Lisette Lujas Flores. You're muted, Lisa. All right, let's start all over again. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are delighted that you're joining us in today's webinar. Um, these are unique times, and the fact that you're making time to, to join us, uh, to learn, to come into community is commendable. So kudos to you for doing that. Um, we want to give you a sense of where we're going today. Um, this is a roadmap of some of the topics we're going to be covering today. Um, centering ourselves in what's going on at this moment in time with the uh, COVID pandemic, and then understanding the types of stress and effects that it um, has on all of us and in different dimensions of our, hum uh, of our being. And then we'll move on to how do we go about caring for our children in this, during these times, and, and with specific tips about safety, connection, hope, and uh, calming strategies that are child-centered. Um, Dr. Um, Joy Fun is going to be talking to us and walking us through that. And then last but not least, but uh, is caring for ourselves, caring for parents and caregivers during this time, addressing uh, parental stress and also how to calm ourselves during this uh, challenging times. And we'll conclude with um, some recommendations and resources for moving forward. Um, and obviously we want to give you some uh, time for questions. Um, and um, so welcome, this is where we're going with this. Um, so let's start uh, with the here and now, right? We are now uh, in a unique and unprecedented time in history, where we're experiencing this major public health crisis with the corona um, pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is an invisible and ambiguous uh, threat, health threat. We don't see it. 
um, we see the outcome of it. And so that uh, ambiguity is very um, disconcerting. It creates this uncertain future. The pandemic is been going on for a while. We have a crisis that's protracted that's going on for a little too long. And with uh, we have been experiencing multiple losses, not just in lives and health um, of uh, many of our loved ones of, of people we know, but also in our uh, everyday life uh, has been very disrupted. Our, our routines have been disrupted. Um, and kind of life is upside down. Now, as psychologists, we know that in times of crisis, um, there are certain things that we need to do, we must do. Uh, you don't need to be a psychologist to be able to support someone through it during a crisis. Uh, next, in, in a time of crisis, caregivers become the essential workers for their children, the ones that are responding immediately, the first responders, the ones that need to provide safety, which is what exactly they need. the kids need, safety, connection and community, hope, and help them calm themselves down. Because any crisis is marked by chaos, by disorganization. It disrupts us in so many different ways, not just um, our routines, but physiologically and in our thoughts. And so parents become those first responders. Next. So as we understand, and again, if we go with from that frame of dealing with an immediate crisis, dealing with something that is particularly difficult, it's important for us to understand how stress works. Right, because stress. There are different types of stress. There is the, the the daily stress, which is more positive, is a normal, essential part of healthy development. Uh, we all experience it at some point in times, and kids experience it as well. You you feel it when your heart is is, is racing up a little bit more. Um, and for instance, anything can trigger those kinds of things. A kid going to the doctor, having a shot, or uh, going the first day of school. Those are daily stressors um, that um, are, are, are um, this rate, uh, bring a little bit of change in our um, system, uh, uh, physiological system, but at the same time, it's, it's positive. It moves us to action, right? It help us engage in new things. But then we have the other type of stress, which is a more terrible stress, but is cumulative, meaning that it adds up, right? Those daily hassles, those things that usually happen, if you don't unpack those, they can really begin to activate our body, our alert system that, that something's going on and begin to tamper with our um, energy levels. Um, it, can, uh, it can be, it can be uh, include things like losing a parent or a national disaster or uh, something like this, um, but it's very time frame very constrained. Uh, and it's terrible if you have a caregiver, someone who loves you and cares for you, who can walk with you through these times. For parents, you know, the cumulative stress is seen in burnout signs. So we'll be talking a little bit more about this, but it's important to understand the differences. If we don't uh, pay attention to, uh, to the cumulative stress, we can have, um, uh, begin to see some, some effects in the long run that uh, uh, would be tapping into different aspects of, of um, the person or the child. And toxic stress is that one that occurs that is prolonged. We're kind of getting there, right? With the protracted long pandemic, we've been in lockdowns, everybody's exhausted, it's long. And there's this long activation of our stress responses. And kids are undergoing uh, these issues as well. I mean, everybody's exhausted of being um, I locked up at home and doing remote uh, learning. Uh, the fatigue, the emotion, the, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, longstanding. But when we talk about toxic stress, we're talking also about more um, stream events uh, that, uh, that, that are frequent and are, are prolonged and that include um, exposure to violence, um, all the kinds of hardships uh, where an, an adult where there's no adequate support by an adult or a caregiver. And that's what we want to avoid. And today's the point of our conversation is precisely to highlight the, the amazing role that parents and caregivers have in uh, avoiding 
in, in minimizing the stress levels so that they don't get to be traumatic or toxic. So the kids can thrive and move forward in their lives um, uh, without being um, um, impacted in the long term uh, with um, the accumulation of stress or the toxic stress. Next. So uh, you probably have heard this many times already because we've been trying to educate um, everyone about the effects of the stress of stress on the body. So we know that research shows us that uh, stress affects us uh, in all aspects of our being, our mind, our soul, our body. Um, in fact, we know that um, there's a lot of technology that is showing us uh, that in, we, in which we can tell you how stressed you are on a daily basis, and even in the long run, for long stretches of time, we can with horm, uh, with some levels of hormones, even saliva, all kinds of things. We can we can figure out how uh, how stressed you are, but what's more concerning is how long you are uh, stressed out, because the accumulation of stress begins to tamper with your physiology, with your body. You start. Um, experiencing uh, um, health issues, your health is compromised. And in the long term, we know that kids and adolescents who are exposed to prolong toxic stress, develop cardiovascular problems, um, other physical problems, the chronic health problems um, that are very um, detrimental. And, um, and so, so it's very important to keep that in mind. Uh, stress also does a number with your mind. Right. Uh, for some, it's a form of, of worry thoughts that lead to anxiety. For others, more paralyzing thoughts of sadness, um, helplessness that lead to depression. And also, it doesn't number with your soul and your relational being. We are designed to be in community, to have relationships, and the pandemic is asking us to be social distance, right? To, to avoid others as much as we can. Um, so that's very troublesome for kids, very troublesome for some of, for all of us. Um, and I invite you to understand and to dig deep a little bit more into how stress impacts all these aspects of your lives. Um, and to help the kids and ad adolescents to understand um, how stress really creeps in. Um, uh, because once you do that, then you know that you have to move in a, with, a, with a, uh, a, a very intentional plan of self-care. Next. All right, so I mentioned that in moments of crisis, there are a couple of principles that are very important to keep in mind in helping um, anybody who is affected by a crisis. And one of them, and first and foremost, is providing safety. Safety um, as, as parents and caregivers means that you will be clearly explaining the risk involved in with the with the um, pandemic. Uh, obviously, always from considering the child's age. You want to know or you want to explain um, uh, and, and clearly um, uh, go through safety um, uh, plans, how to wear the mask, when to wear the mask, why the social distancing, even internet security. Now that we our kids are um, online so all so much with remote learning. Um, so very important that you provide that uh, information, that security, um, that you remember that in times of crisis, there's chaos, there's disorganization. So as a parent, your role is to bring, to establish routines, to try to get as close to a normal um, um, schedule as possible, to have a schedule um, where things are a little bit more predictable. That is That provides kids a sense of security uh, that um, uh, will allow them to thrive in difficult times. Set boundaries and clear roles, very important. You know, in this time, kids are cooked up at home on the computer all the time. Maybe one rule would be, hey, you could have lunch. Uh, when you have lunch, it should not be in your room. It should be in the dining room, in the patio, somewhere else besides where you're sitting up uh, taking your classes remotely. Very basic routines and very clear rules are very important, again, in providing that safety, that structure that's so needed in a moment of crisis. Um, and of course, there are kids that will get very dysregulated because of the pandemic, because they are being hit with somebody in the family, perhaps having COVID, having to go to the emergency room, having to be hospitalized. 
if the kid gets very dysregulated, very upset and out of control uh, in many ways that you feel that the worries are above and beyond what most kids will be feeling in, this, in these kinds of times, then reach out, mobilize support. There are many mental health providers and psychologists that can help, uh, met, uh, MFT social workers that can assist you via telehealth and um, help you get unstuck and at the same time provide the safety that your child needs. Community, next, connection and community. We are clearly designed to be in community, to be in relationships, and now that is all upside down with the social distancing, right? But parents are always very creative, and I love the ideas that parents have in terms of establishing connections. Very important, communicate with family members. You know, you can really encourage kids and adolescents to go back to the old fashioned letters. <laughs> you know, yes, we are grading very good with computers, but I think helping kids communicate with others, with the family, with the community, with signs. Um, when I go for walks, there are some, some um, uh, homes that have signs that kid had made for the community. And it's a lovely way to reconnect with others. So help your kids connect in unique and creative ways with others, with others in need. I have a friend who um, decided that she needed to get her kids out, but she also needed to get them connected to the community. So she made a couple of phone calls and realized that one nonprofit uh, program in the area had a garden that was neglected because the staff is so taxed trying to help the community. So she and her three kids volunteer to take care of the garden. And they go together once a week, they take care of the garden. At first, you know, she told me like everybody was whining, too much work, oh my God. But in the end, it has turned out to be a fantastic opportunity for her to promote community, right? The kids are helping, it's a larger, uh, doing the gardening with a larger purpose in mind um, uh, to, to, to impact their community, to share with the community. They're having fun, they're working hard, they're getting some vitamin D from the sun. It's a win-win for others. So the takeaway from this is get creative, find ways to reconnect, to instill that connection with others and community because that's where we draw the strength and the resilience. Next. And hope. Yes, during moments of crisis, we need to instill hope. Remember, a crisis is a times of danger. Absolutely. And so you have to set up the safety and the security for kids. But it's also a time of opportunity and change. It's a time, and this is a time when we need to remember our kids are resilient. They bound, they have many strengths, they bounce back very quickly if they are well supported. Um, if we could channel the strengths, they have the strengths they can find a way to cope with the crisis. You know, whether it's nature, music, writing, sports, faith, whatever it is, find their strengths and hand your hat in there um, and instill that sense of hope that they can transcend these difficult times with the inner strengths that they have, with the community that they have, uh, with a sense of transcendence um, in this moment in time. And during difficult times in the pandemic, we also have loss. Right, the mourning is an ongoing process. So keep that in mind. For some kids, will be uh, you will be struggling with them as they mourn the loss of friends, of family members, um, and it's it's challenging. And in this science, you need to be mindful of the child's age, where they are, to be able to address the grieving and um, connect and, and give them hope. Uh, we'll have some um, uh, resources on how to support kids that are grieving the loss of someone during time of crisis, um, but hope will get them through. Um, so I'm going to stop there because um, <clears throat> right now we are going to move into the other aspect, uh, the other um, critical component in addressing the crisis, which is calming yourself, right? Uh, centering yourself. So Dr. Joy Fan is going to walk us through some of this. Well, thank you, Dr. Rojas Flores. Um, I think we all can agree that we are living in this unprecedented time that in the face of stress, I think in working with children when supporting parents, it is important to kind of like um, highlight two common ways in which we may respond to difficult times. On the one hand, um, 
Sometimes we may choose to suppress or avoid our emotions. So we may try to put up a happy face and pretend that everything is okay. So sometimes our kids may be quote unquote strivers. So they try to kind of like buckle up, sweep the emotions under the rug and just kind of move on. Um, or behaviorally, it may look like um, your kids may be spending a lot of time playing video games or binge watching like Netflix and simply to numb their feelings. And we know that suppression or avoidance of feelings kind of work in the short run, right? In the moment when we're lost in Netflix, we can forget our problem. But we do know that in the long run, it will come back to harm us. Um, and because emotions will come back one way or another. So that's kind of one way um, that we may manage stress. The other way, which is on the other end of the continuum, is that sometimes our kids may be thinkers. Like we like to kind of think about our problems, think about the root of the problem, think about solutions, think about the pros and the cons and the different scenarios. And it may create an illusion that we're very productive, we're gaining insight, we're discovering like the root of the problem. Um, but the clinical term for this is actually rumination, is that we think about a lot of these things and sometimes we think about it and then we judge ourselves and then so we think about it and then we feel bad about thinking about it and then we feel bad about feeling bad. And it's kind of like bunnies that multiply a lot quicker than we can catch up. And again, we know that the more we think, the stickier our thoughts um, get to us and the more it affects us. Um, so neither of these two forms, you know, trying to suppress our emotions or thinking over and over about um, our problems are healthy. And we'd like to talk about something that is healthier like a middle alternative, um, like mindfulness. So mindfulness is kind of a happy medium between the suppression and also the rumination. So by now, most of you guys have heard about mindfulness. It's kind of this buzzword the last um, kind of decade. Um, so what is mindfulness? So mindfulness is paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So there are three aspects, um, three parts of this definition that I wanted to highlight. The first is paying attention. So the synonym of mindfulness is alertness. So being mindful means that you are aware, you are very intentional, you are very alert. So in my work with kids, sometimes I had a kid one time come up to me very proudly declaring that I have been practicing sleeping mindfully. Um, and sleeping mindfully is an oxymoron. Like you, by definition, you cannot do that. You have to be alert and awake. So if you're practicing mindfulness and you fall asleep, that doesn't count. Um, and that's opposed to mindlessness, right? Like, and we may all relate that we had a long day at work and we come home, we prop ourselves in front of the TV, we open a bag of chips or a tub of ice cream and turn on Netflix. And the next minute we know, like the bag is empty. We finished a whole bag of chips and we've already watched three episodes of Bridgerton or something. And we're like, where did the last three hours go, right? That's kind of like mindlessness. Um, like we could be on autopilot, kind of like doing the same things over and over. Which again, there is the time and place for that. You know, we want to be efficient. We can't be like very intentional and very alert every moment of our time. That's not like realistic either. But what we're saying is that we want to strive a balance, a healthy balance, where we want to be also create um, opportunities and times for us to be aware and alert. So that's the first kind of part of the definition is paying attention. But also mindfulness is about paying attention in the present moment, okay? Our minds, um, and we live a lot in our minds, especially in the Western culture. We like to think about things, we like to analyze, we like to um, kind of, we, we rely a lot on, on, our, on our mental um, capacities. And sometimes our mind will take us to the past. You know, we may relive the glorious days pre-COVID. We may think about like how, 
life was so different, how school was different, all the things that we used to do when things were normal and we're not in the lockdown. And it may conjure up a lot of kind of like sadness or even like regrets, wishing that you had done things differently. Or our mind may take us to the, to the, to the future. You know, we may feel like we are stuck in this waiting period, that this COVID is causing this pause and we just can't wait for this to be over. And we just want to look forward to the day when COVID um, is over. And so we may think about the future um, with longing anticipation, or we may think about the future in terms of worry. You know, we may worry about like, when school goes back again, what will life looks like? Um, maybe for some families who struggle with unemployment, what will life look like next year? And so we may think about um, and worry about the future. So if our mind is in the past or in the future, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, by definition, we're not living in the present moment. We're not in the here and the now. And mindfulness is about really about this moment, this current moment it may not be perfect. It may be full of stress, but how can we kind of live life to the fullest in the midst of all this chaos and ambiguities? Um, so it's present mo moment focused. And finally, um, mindfulness is really about curiosity and openness. I think um, we as humans tend to be very evaluative. We like to judge things as good or bad. Like there is this notion that feeling happy is good and feeling sad is, is bad. Um, that is not okay to feel anxious, that angry is bad um, um, or angry is, is negative. Um, and I would argue otherwise, you know, it is this spectrum of emotions. Um, obviously, if you feel, very, very sad most of the time and only small pockets of happiness, then we need to kind of like um, get you help and support. But overall, I think thoughts, emotions, they are, they're pleasant or unpleasant. They're not good or bad. They're not right or wrong. So oftentimes when we think about like, oh no, sadness is bad, then we always want to like replace it. We want to judge ourselves. Um, and that's the opposite of mindfulness. We want to be open. We want to be curious. We want to lean in and say, huh, I'm feeling really sad today. I wonder why. Like I'm feeling anxious about this aspect. What does this tell me about? And so this allows us to create some distance from our thoughts so that it's not kind of us feeling so attached to our thoughts, evaluating it, and then kind of, um, and then, and then spinning out of control. So with that said, what does it mean to cultivate mindfulness? So I'm gonna talk about kind of very broadly, like in more macro terms, what does cultivating mindfulness, what is the role of mindfulness when we think about um, supporting children? And then I'll talk about some more specific practices. So one is that you want to validate their emotions and experiences. You're not validating their behaviors if, there is, if it is inappropriate. So you're not saying that, oh, it's okay for you to slam the doors or it's okay for you to hit your brother, you know? But you're validating the emotions. You're saying that, I, can, I see your pain. I see you're in a lot of stress. I understand you, you've been looking forward to this birthday party and yet we have to cancel again. I, you are disappointed, of course you are. I think sometimes parents would tell me that whenever their kids whine or complain, they would remind them of how fortunate they are, you know, like they're like, at least you have like a house, at least you have like three warm meals. Um, think of all these other people who don't. And I do think there is a time for cultivating gratitude, but that can also hijack, you know, um, kind of their, their, their feelings. So again, we don't want to kind of like pretend that everything is okay. We don't want to say, hey, let's kind of come up, like let's just pretend that COVID is not here and we'll just, you know, strive. Um, that's not realistic either. So you really want it to kind of like validate and say like, yes, we are living in this very strange times. I am navigating new um, waters too. I, I don't know. I don't know all the answers. And this is a new normal. So you want to validate their experiences. You also want to create space. What that means is that, especially if your kid is a thinker, you know, they like to think about things. They like to dwell in their minds and like really think the way out of problems. Oftentimes thoughts um, beget thoughts. 
and begets more thoughts. And that's kind of a recipe for anxiety. You want to create space. You want to kind of say like, you know, your thoughts do not define you. You have thoughts in this moment. Um, so in this moment, you have these thoughts um, and it is okay. Let's kind of talk about um, what we can do. Let's kind of like connect it with our bodies. Let's talk about like what would make sense for you. And so you kind of create also pauses. You don't want to kind of like go on autopilot the whole day. You want to create pauses in your life and create space. So you're better able to, um, to manage the stress. The third is you want to connect thoughts, feelings, and bodies. So we are, each of us have thoughts, right? We have our mind that think, we have feelings, and it shows up in our body. I think um, sometimes we are more fluent in one language than the other. So sometimes kids, they are very um, perhaps sensitive to their bodily sensations. So I would hear parents talk about like, oh, my kids complain about having like stomach aches or like having a headache or having chest pain. And we would go to like the pediatrician and we can't, nothing is showing up, you know? And of course, like it's anxiety or stress and it's showing up in their bodies. Um, some kids is in the, in the form of thoughts. They just tell you all these thoughts they have in their minds that keeps them up. Um, and for some, it's like they have a harder time perhaps understanding the emotions, right? Emotions are one word, feelings usually. Um, so if I ask a kid, like, how are you feeling? And they say, I feel like my world is about to collapse. Like, wow, that is a thought, you know, you, that's a pretty overwhelming thought. But what is the feeling associated with it? So one way to really help your kid is to kind of like see where they are, you know? Is your kid someone who likes to suppress, to pretend that everything is okay or to numb their feelings? Or is your kid a thinker or a ruminator? Is your kid really good with their thoughts or with their bodies? And you wanna connect. You wanna say, oh, you have this thought. What is the feeling associated with it? And where is it showing up in your body? And so you want them, you want all three parts to talk and communicate with each other. And overall, this will allow them to manage stress. The idea is that we can't, we can't get rid of stress, if that makes sense. Like we can't get rid of stress the more. So yesterday I had a COVID vaccine and my arm is very sore um, and I've not been feeling well, but I know that the more I focus on my arm and how sore it is, the more it bothers me. So I can't really get rid of the soreness. I can't get rid of, of COVID. I can't get rid of the stress of having to do virtual learning. But what we can do is change the way we relate to stress, change the way we see stress. And again, mindfulness is about creating distance and space. The more I'm able to like release and let go, the more space I can create and the less the soreness on my arm bothers me, okay? Versus if we kind of like, focus and fixate and try to like, like will our way to get rid of the soreness on my arm, it's going to um, kind of the opposite. So this is kind of like the higher kind of macro level of what mindfulness is. What does it mean? Mindfulness is one of those things where I can just sit in front of you and tell you all the benefits of it and what it is, and you won't reap the benefits until you practice it. It has to be an experienced um, concept. And whenever I talk about mindfulness, people kind of have these images of these monks or these like experienced people like sitting cross-legged, completely still um, for 30 minutes or even an hour and immediately be like, that's not me, I can't. Or I can't even get my kid to sit still for a minute, let alone like 30 minutes. What are you talking about? So those are kind of like formal meditation practices, you know, of sitting, we call this body scan um, for like 30 minutes. That's one way to practice mindfulness, but it's not the only way, you know, like um, since the pandemic, I've started watching these YouTubes about um, workouts. I'm, I'm never into exercise, but I decide that I really have to move my body. And I find that I'm really attracted to those who keep talking about like progress, not perfection, you know, like, any little bit of movement, if you can move for two minutes, if you can move for five minutes, that's better than zero minutes. You don't have to shoot for like 30 minute like cardio or I don't even know the terms, like, like in 30 minutes of whatever stretching, anything is better than nothing. And that's kind of like my approach to it. 
we want to infuse mindfulness into your life. You, we want to infuse mindfulness into the parents and in the kid's life. So I'm going to talk about a few examples of what that is. And I'll give more examples um, in the handout. One is mindful walking. So I started taking kind of these daily walks. Sometimes I walk it with my kids. And I try to be really in the present moment. What that means is that instead of walking and thinking about the grocery list, I really focus on what I'm seeing. I look at what I see. When I'm with my kids, they are really good at walking very slowly. My kid would just pause and just stop at, a, at this grass area and kind of comment on these flowers. And it's great because it is kind of bringing me back to the present moment. You know, you're focusing on your body, focusing on your posture. You're not just trying to get from point A to point B as fast as you can. Like you are just being in the present moment, you know, or mindfully eating. Dr. Rojas Flores talked about like, it is good to, you know, set up some boundaries where you don't eat, where you work, you eat on the patio or in the living room. Um, and we're so used to like just wolfing down our lunch in front of a TV or in front of a computer because we're so busy. But mindfully eating is like, after we make a plate, after we microwave or after we cook our food, we actually take a look. We look at what we're eating and then we slowly digest. We look at like, like the food, the colors, the texture, and then we eat slowly um, and mindfully. I've shared this a lot with, with kids. And one time a kid came up to me and said like, my mom didn't like it because I was eating too slow. I was trying to mindfully eat lunch and my spaghetti and meatballs. And I was spending like more than 30 minutes and she got mad at me. And I was like, if I'm your mom, I would probably be mad too. <laughs> Cause you can't like, because like, it's also not realistic. You know, we can't, we don't have the luxury of spending an hour for breakfast, for lunch and for dinner. Um, to mindfully eat. While that may be nice, we just don't have to, it's not realistic. So what's realistic is perhaps like a snack, you know, or perhaps like every time when you have a meal in front of you, the first bite, you know, maybe it is like really aware of your environment. Maybe it's the first couple minutes. Maybe it's just overall, you are noticing the colors, the texture, the different types of food that you're, you're eating. Using the five senses, you know, this is someone for, for a kid who may be like in the moment is really anxious or really fixated on things and feels like, oh, I am like feeling very anxious and tense in this moment. Five senses is a good way to ground um, a kid um, or for adults for that matter. Always remember that whenever you find your mind like spinning or going fast or going to the present or to the, oh, sorry, going to the past or to the future, always connect them back to the, to, the, to the body. The body is always in the here and the now. So whenever you focus on the body, by definition, you are in the present moment. So when a kid is already kind of spinning or is kind of ruminating or very anxious, you want to ground them with the five senses. Hey, what is one thing you can touch? What is one thing you can look? I spy three things. I spy um, this. Let's go to the um, herbs um, section and like smell the herbs. Um, uh, what do you hear? What do you smell? So all these are kind of like grounding techniques and it can look very differently. Some people like to do like, let's name one color, two sounds, three furry objects, and you can kind of make it as fun or as age appropriate for your kid. And the last practice I'm gonna highlight is mindful breathing. Um, mindful breathing, breathing practices, I would say is the foundation of all mindfulness practices. Because again, we all breathe. It is probably one of the most like mindless thing we do, yet it keeps us alive, is we don't focus on our, we don't pay attention to how we breathe. But the breathing is always a good anchor because it is always in the here and the now. It's always, you're, we're always breathing. So, it is always good to help practice kind of mindful breathing. I would say that mindful breathing is very different from deep breathing in a sense where sometimes when a kid is in the middle of kind of maybe a mini panic attack or was really anxious, you may hear kind of we say that like, now let's take some deep breaths. That's a good because you are breathing to kind of relax yourself. But mindful breathing is different. Mindful breathing is not this band-aid that you put when the kid is already anxious. And, and, uh, and, I would say that you want to help practice mindful breathing when they're not anxious. You want to do it when they're actually feeling okay and you are creating pockets of space. 
Okay, so what that means is that you could kind of find some time maybe before bedtime when you wake up during transitions, you know, as a family, you can like breathe together. I would include a script of mindful breathing in the handout, but there could be different ways. One way with, with little kids is that you could put your hands on the, on the kind of on a, on a stomach, on the diaphragm. It's kind of like in this picture and you can kind of say, okay, let's imagine a balloon. You breathe and the balloon is inflating, inflating, and then you breathe out and it deflates. And then some of times like with these images, it can help the kid. And we are just kind of like, okay, let's just breathe. No need to breathe any differently. No need to do like this scooper diving <gasps> like that. Like you just want to breathe naturally. Um, and it's kind of like a, a transition, okay? Sometimes like parents ask like, what is a good time to do it? It's less about the time. It's not like every three o'clock. But for me, it's always kind of like related to like, um, like an activity. So for, for me, weirdly speaking, I do it every time when I boil hot water. So I put my water on and then it's like, it, it takes like five minutes. And then that's my cue. I, I boil water almost twice a day. And every time when I boil water, I don't have anything else to do. I would just breathe. And it is almost my cue to do it. And so every time if you can connect it with something, or sometimes we put stickers on a bathroom mirror for kids that when they go to the bathroom and see themselves, they, um, they're able to, to breathe. So that's, um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Rahat's Flores to talk about um, mind, uh, uh, to talk about parenting and self-care. Thank you, Dr. Fon. I appreciate it. Very helpful tips um, for how to help kids manage stress and cope with the stress of uh, the pandemic and the everyday stress. Very, very helpful. But you know, caregivers also we are not immune to stress and in fact I will say we as parents are in that perfect storm right where we have not only the pandemic but we are working managing uh, home life and for many of us are working from home as well um, and it is quite stressful um, it's hard to focus it's hard to get things done um, and on top of that we might be experiencing financial stressors for some of you you might have lost your job um, and then you're dealing with all the behavioral um, changes in your kids that are trying to cope and then they might be more fearful they might have more trouble sleeping. Um, what we know now is that um, the relationships with our partners are also strained because everybody's stressed out. Their bandwidth is just short. <laughs> um, and so it's no wonder that we are finding out that at this moment in time, many parent child, there are many parent child conflicts going on more than what we have heard before. And that parents are reporting that they are using more discipline during the pandemic, more spanking, more yelling because everybody is on edge. Um, and so what is very important is that we acknowledge that as parents, we actually have a double dose of, of stress that we're managing. We have to manage ourselves, our own stress, and then manage, uh, help manage the, the stress of our kids and our um, partners sometimes. Um, when we recognize this next, um, we, um, we can be a little bit more compassionate on ourselves. And this is one thing that uh, Dr. Fong was mentioning. Um, because the stress begins to temper with all aspects of your being, we know that as caregivers, as the ones that are holding our kids in our backs, we might be experiencing burnout. And it's very important that you uh, recognize those signs of burnout. And they're, again, because we are beings that have a physical, emotional, um, uh, spiritual dimension. We feel it in every aspect of our, uh, of our um, beings and physical signs of burnout could be chronic fatigue, low energy, a lot of us are there, um, a change in appetite and, um, and, and, and getting more sick uh, freak, uh, 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 than, than usual. And emotional signs could be that you find yourself self-doubting and feeling like a sense of failure as a parent. Uh, like, oh my God, I can't manage my kid. I don't know, I should be better. I just have to be good enough. But anyway, emotional signs are important to keep uh, kind of tabs on what's going on um, or a sense of feeling like a sense of that you're defeated, that, that you're completely discouraged. Behavioral signs are those signs that you can see things that you're doing, right? 
you know, you tend to withdraw more from others to isolate yourself from others. You're not calling as much as you used to. You're not trying to reach out to others as much as you used to. Perhaps you might be turning to drugs or uh, uh, food <laughs> to kind of sell to to calm yourself down, or you know just the lack of uh, discipline to self care to get yourself out of the house and exercise or in the house. And then the spiritual dimension, the, the community social dimension, which is finding yourself sometimes questioning, um, uh, what's the purpose in life anyway? Those are signs of burnout that you need to take care of. You are a superhero um, as a mom, as a, as a parent, as a father, as a caregiver of children and adolescents during this moment in time. So you, uh, superheroes also need to rest and also need to uh, self-care. So my question to you next is, what is your plan for self-care? What are you doing um, to uh, take care of yourself? What's your personal plan? What personal plan do you have for taking care of yourself during the, the pandemic? This is a crisis. And in any crisis, you also always do, you anticipate crisis when you create plans of action. If this happens, we can do this. If this happens, we can do that. So that you have some sense of control. When we fly in an airplane, the first thing that they tell you is, you know, we might have a problem in the flight. So if that happens, you know, the oxygen mask is gonna drop, put the mask, oxygen mask first as a parent, as a caregiver, put it first and then put it on your child. Literally what they're saying to you and what applies to a situation is, if you run out of oxygen as a parent, you cannot help your child. Okay, it's the same thing in this moment. You have to oxygenate, you have to take care of yourself and you'll be a better, uh, better helper for, uh, for your kid. Develop a personal plan of self-care, whatever it is, you know, one little thing. One of the things that I do is at the end of the day, I go for a walk around the neighborhood. Sometimes they're short because I have to come back to cook or do something with my kids. Um, or sometimes they're long because my husband might be here and he can take care of the kids and I could go on for long walks, which are lovely. Or sometimes I scoop them up with me and they come with me and they go for a walk with me. Um, but I try to maintain that as a, uh, my commitment to self-care because walking helps me exercise, it grounds me, connects me with nature, gets me out of my room, out of my home, and it gives me more perspective. So find your rhythm. You have to find your rhythm. It, hasn't, it doesn't have to be huge, but find a rhythm, find something to refuel your soul, to refuel constantly. Um, some of the techniques that Dr. Joy Farm mentioned are fantastic, little tiny five minutes, you know, three minutes exercises that will develop the habit of self-caring and refueling. This is a long journey. The pandemic is here with us for a long time. We're crossing the desert and you cannot cross it if you don't refuel, if you don't take water, if you don't sleep well, if you don't have good shoes, because you're carrying the kids in the back. Your kids will tell you when they need help, right? They will cry, but you will need to be sure to take care of yourself to be able to move them forward. They will survive, kids are resilient, but they need caring adults to be able to manage all the different levels of stress that we have talked about. Next. So I'll be brief um, about mindful parenting. I'll be um, doing another webinar in April specifically on mindful parenting, but I'm gonna highlight um, a couple things. The first is that parenting ultimately is relational. We can talk about like strategies, but ultimately it is about relating. So it is about being versus doing. It is really, you give, the best gift you can give to your child is you, is your presence. And so what that means is that you want to be very kind to yourself. Perfection is not what you're striving for. Um, you want to like really lower your standards and be very realistic, you know, like maybe like you won't be able to cook as much. Maybe you just have to order more fast foods and something has to give. Or maybe it is about like kind of setting realistic expectations that I can only offer 30 minutes of uninterrupted, mindfully present time with my kids. And for those 30 minutes, I am I am there for my kid. I'm there baking with my kid. I'm there listening to my kid because we all know that sometimes our kids have talked to us and we're sort of there, but we're not there. 
and kids smell blood. So it's much better to, you know, like have, have small amounts of time, maybe even 30 minutes is too much, 15 minutes, where you give undefined attention to them. And then for other things, you will kind of like let go. They may be watching more screens than you would like, but again, you need to survive. You need to extend compassion to your kids and being able to do that means you need to show compassion to yourself. Um, so here's some examples of how you do it. I'm not going to go in details for the sake of time. Um, and this is a handout that you will receive um, after today's webinar. It uh, gives a little bit of a script I've mentioned about the mindful breathing. And at the end, um, I also give some examples of what, how you can infuse mindfulness in your child's life. Think about really about the infusing, the incorporating. Um, how can you do that in a way that's, a, that's sustainable to you? Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fran. Those are fantastic tools that you will get at the end. Uh, but just as a, a, a wrapping up, remember, we are in a time of crisis. In a time of crisis, we try to move our kids to provide safety, safety and security first. That's the number one in a time of crisis. This is a protracted crisis, so you're going to have to infuse hope. You also have to uh, uh, infuse connection and community. It kind of goes against the physical distancing, but there are creative ways to stay connected. That's part of who we are. That helps us regulate, that gives us meaning. And then practice some of the self calming strategies that Dr. Um, Fun just mentioned. Those are fantastic ways of, of uh, um, uh, helping ourselves not be as aroused as and stressed out. And all of the suggestions that we have given you, be mindful about the, 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 the stage of the child, the, the age of the child. You know, you would talk differently to an adolescent than you would talk to a younger kid, to a toddler or a school-aged child. So find ways to communicate in which they're relevant to them and um, give as much information as they're capable of taking in um, at their age. And remember, as caregivers, as parents, you are in the front lines. You got to also take care of yourself. Oftentimes, we're always giving, giving, and forget that we are. Uh, we need to uh, put on the oxygen mask to last longer. And reach out, reach out, and get some help and uh, from uh, mental health, especially if you need, especially if you need some more guidance. Uh, with telehealth, we can definitely be. Um, uh, uh, more of a resource to you. So we have now uh, the next slide. Um, we have now uh, for you, and uh, you'll be getting some of these resources available. Um, um, several blogs that Dr. Joy Fun has uh, written on mindfulness, and they are fantastic for this moment in time, in terms of regulating ourselves, paying attention to our physical, our emotional, and our um, uh, soul. Um, and there's also some specific, um, two other uh, uh, resources here that are uh, addressing more, more the issue of grief and loss. And we could continue talking about that in another time, but be on the lookout. Dr. Joy Fran is going to be having a webinar um, in the in the coming um, in, in in the future, very very near future, right? Um, oh. On mindfulness, okay. yes. Can you tell us about it real quick? So it will be specifically on mindful parenting. So meaning, like, how can parents practice mindfulness? What would mindful parenting look like um, in relating with your child? Um, kind of tips, practices um, to to remain sane as parents. Oh, we need those tips. I was using myself. So be on the lookout for that webinar. We'll be sending you um, announcements. Uh, so you'll be, you know, you could you could hear Dr. Fran explaining this concept a little bit more. We always, we could talk forever. Um, but, you know, again, we are cognizant. Everybody's bandwidth is not that long. So um, these are resources for you, helpful resources. And we're going to be posting them on our Thrive web page. So um, uh, along with the recording of this, of this webinar. We have now uh, a few minutes for our questions, and uh, we'll try to answer them. Um, do you want to throw something at us, Andrea? You've been managing the chat. Um, sure. All right. The very first question. For parents, full-time work at home in the same room as a third grader who is constantly asking questions and who is also a law student at night, are there any suggestions? You want to tackle that, Dr. Fun? 
Sure, I'll give a first step. Um, oh, I really, I feel like my heart goes out to you. Like, I feel like that's, that is hard. So I would say, um, obviously, ultimately you want to survive. So with a third grader constantly asking questions, um, every kid is different. But for example, you can try strategies like setting a timer and saying like, okay, for the next whatever kind of minutes makes sense, like for the next 20 or 30 minutes, um, I'd like you to be quiet in this corner and kind of do your work on something. And then when the timer is up, I'll give you two minutes of my time. Um, and so you're kind of like shaping and reinforcing that independence learning or independence play um, a little longer. I think it's also um, good to share, I think, uh, to cultivate empathy in a sense where I share with the kid that like mama needs some time, you know, or dada needs some time, mom or dad needs um, some space and I would need to work. And so I would need until whatever time. So when the timer goes off, then we can like do something small. We can go take a walk to get some water and come back to the room. Um, but having something for them to anticipate um, and setting some form of a timer may be, may be helpful. Um, and again, also like you may have to kind of like lower certain like expectations and let them do more screen than you would like because your peace of mind, it's as important if not more um, in the long haul. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fern, for sharing that. And I just have to say, I love that as we're talking about these interruptions, I heard your kid in the back calling you. <laughs> so that kind of shows we just have to be good enough parents. We don't have to be perfect. We try our best. In this time of the pandemic, there is a lot of grace. Uh, so find those pockets, get creative. You know, if, if the child is interrupting a lot, you can say, hey, Write me the question, I'm, I'm working, don't say it, write it out. So that's gonna slow the child a little bit too. And then after you know, 15 minutes or so, you could check the, the writing board or questions that they may have, something like that, like a chat um, that's going on while you're trying to connect. Get creative. Um, we are uh, almost out of time. Is there another question, uh, Andrea? Yes, this one is for you, Dr. Rojas. Um, I have a young child and a teenager. Are there any tips on how to talk about stress to them differently? Thank you. Yes, very differently. Um, with an adolescent, you could definitely be much, much more uh, detailed with your information. You have to be credible. You have to rel have reliable sources. You have to listen to them. Practice your listening skills and listen first as to what are their concerns. Before spilling a whole bunch of information, you want to know where they're coming from, what kind of information do they have. Are they getting it from TikTok? Are they getting it from YouTube? What it kind of information do they have? And then you correct in um, uh, what misinformation they might be getting. Um, and uh, with credible data, with credible, inf credible information, and then you moving along, you're answering, engaging in a dialogue with, with an adolescent. With a younger child, you might not, need, you still need to know where they're coming from because kids, if they don't hear from parents, they're going to fill in the blanks. They're going to have come up with their own version of why it's happening, what coronavirus is about, what could happen. And so you want to understand also what is their perspective and then correct it in a more child-friendly way, right? Um, there, I love uh, sometimes watching videos of uh, two uh, YouTube videos of younger kids finding uh, the pandemic and they actually get it. You know, they get the basis of um, uh, um, protecting ourselves with a mask and why we need to do that. But listen to some of those ways that kids are talking, younger kids are talking about the pandemic that might be helpful. Uh, in, uh, or you can use some of that as an example to the kid of how, to your younger kid, of how to understand what the pandemic is about and to help them with some of their fears. But again, it's being, making the space and time to talk to both of them and uh, uh, adjusting your language and your communication according to the level. Um, uh, in which they're in. Um, and at times you can bring them together, the adolescent can actually be a fantastic communicator with a younger kid, right? 
because there are things that they have their own bond as uh, siblings that um, um, uh, might be uh, very helpful for the younger child to see how the adolescent is coping. All right, I think uh, we have another question and we'll conclude with that. Is that correct, Amir? Yes, I will read you um, the question. It says, our school was really great in person, but going virtual, the bar now is so low. Any suggestions on how to ask for more from teachers? We feel very let down, sorry, by their lack of availability, lack of creativity. They are really doing the bare minimum. And I feel my daughter is struggling more because expectations are so low. She gets zero feedback from her teachers on all the work she hands in. All right. Yes, and this and and this is like I mentioned. This is a time when everybody is um, uh, exhausted, and we see it with the teachers. I mean, if you can reach out to the teachers and say, "Hey, this is what's happening," um, maybe uh, and give some suggestions. Uh, uh, remember, also have some grace on the teachers. They are as stressed out as you are, perhaps sometimes more, <laughs> because they have many kids in the class and they have to manage. Um, perhaps offer suggestions or help. You know. Uh, uh, teachers love to have volunteers. If there are ways that you can offer some help to uh, come as a guest speaker one day and talk about your profession, or perhaps say, listen, I'd be happy to run uh, a breakout room and engage some of the kids. You might be able to mobilize some of your parents who are concerned about the quality of engagement and say, hey, we'll be willing to help you out with one lesson plan and we'll run the, the groups and tell us what to do and we'll run it. You know how much we love that as teachers? I am a, a, a teacher myself. I love to have guest speakers because it gives me a little bit of a space to back off and be the one listening. So come up with ideas to help support the teachers and enhance the quality of the, of the uh, teaching for your kid. And at the same time, I had to say, this time our standards in, 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 in learning have, to have, have gone down for everyone. So ways that you find ways that you can supplement at home, uh, perhaps with other uh, resources online, they're fantastic things that you can do to supplement um, the learning um, and you have a little bit more control. Um, but hang in there. It's, it's a time where it, our creativity is being put to the test and um, it will get us out of many uh, of these frustrating situations and, and really enhance uh, the thriving of our kids and, and uh, of everyone um, if we can come along one another. Okay, I think that's all we have for now. Is that correct? Um, uh, yes. it, it's what I want to, did I know, is there another slide? I forget. This is okay. Okay, uh, yes. So uh, make sure to check the recorded version of this webinar uh, because it's going to be available on our website, uh, www.thrivecenter.org. We are posting also the resources that we have uh, listed here and other ones as well. Dr. Joy Fong has a ton of great mindfulness resources and also be on the lookout for her webinar. It's a really good one that continue to build upon what we've been talking about, addressing the mind, the physical aspect, the body and the soul of our kids and of ourselves. You know, parenting during a crisis is hard, um, but we can uh, 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 make it. We will thrive through this if we uh, are mindful of how to take care of ourselves and mindful of how stress um, um, begins to impact all aspects of our lives. So go in peace. Thank you so much. Um, if, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Fon, for joining us. Fantastic tips. And thank you for Andrea uh, Gonzalez for helping us manage maneuver through this webinar. Um, all the best to you. Take care. <laughs>